about serving God while I come to Illinois in this kind of weather. Amen. <laughs> minister the word. I mentioned this the other night at the Awakening Conference that in Kentucky, I, I hate cold weather anywhere. I just hate it. And I have to fight really about the first of November. I start to have to cast out grief because of the winter's coming. I can't ride the motorcycle like I want to. And, you know, it just, I don't, I don't like it. It's like, See, my house always stays like an igloo. That's for Bob will attest to that. <laughs> but at least I could go outside to get warm. I can't even do that. <laughs> and I would say, God, why couldn't you give me a church in Hawaii or Southern Florida or even Texas? Praise God. And uh, then I come to Illinois and I say, thank you for Kentucky, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I've had a great time being here and enjoying the fellowship and, and the Word. And I love the Word of God. Amen? Amen. It's what changes me. It's what, it, it's, it's what brings us into connection with the Lord, the Lord Jesus. And so are you ready for the Word tonight? Amen. Pastor Mike, Rachel, thank you for having me again. I know you guys have people all the time. It could be a stretch, so I'm just honored that you would let me step behind your pulpit. Uh, hopefully it's worth your while. Amen. 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 Uh, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. Let's get into this. And I may even start to tie together some of the messages I've done for the past couple services with this. But, but that's not hard because I mean all the word ties together. Amen. Amen. It's all interconnected. Amen. Rob, you made it tonight. I thought you were going to make it tonight. You were afraid I was going to preach about you. Guys. I was No telling what he'll say about me. I, I hope you didn't waste a trip, but it won't change what I say about you regardless. Of you. Amen. Let me get my iPad open up here. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. Say, go on. Go on. Let us go on unto perfection. Wow, what a target, perfection. How many want to walk perfect in Christ? Yeah. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of laying on of hands. I mean, most of the church doesn't even receive the doctrine of laying on of hands. And the writer of Hebrews says, we've got to go beyond that. Most of the church has to catch up to that. But we're to be going beyond that. And of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Well, God does permit. Amen. God wants us to go on. And here it says we're to go on unto perfection. Now, this morning in Morton, I preached on uh, diligence. And the word diligence in the, in the New Testament really doesn't mean what we think of diligence with regard to it in, in our English language. It's got a really a totally different meaning. And when we read in the New Testament, if you're reading the King James, you may have a different version that says something differently. How, how many has something in, in, in chapter 6, verse 1 that says something besides perfection? Anybody? Does everybody say perfection? Something similar? Uh, well, that word perfection isn't really what we usually think of perfection uh, again in the English language. We usually think of perfection is without flaw, without mistake, everything perfectly aligned, everything glistening with perfection. Right? How do you think about that? You either think about that or you think about Pastor Jack, one or the other. I don't know which one it is that you pick perfection. Should have got an amen out of something. Amen. Uh, amen. God gives grace to the humble. Everybody else, He gives a wife. Humble. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. And I've been doing some research on this word for perfection in the New Testament. And the truth is, there there are quite a few words in the Greek that in your King James Bible are translated perfection. In fact, there's a whole set of them. And I'm not going to take time to cover all those words tonight, and we're going to talk about two of them. 
The first word in the Greek is the word, it's Strong's number 5046, and the word is teleos. Let me spell it because I don't know how to pronounce it. T-E-L-E-I-O-S. And the word teleos means to be brought to an end, finished, nothing lacking, and the primary meaning is fully matured, fully grown up. But what I want you to know just starting out tonight is, is when you read the word perfection in the, in the New Testament, don't think you have to be totally perfect in your walk with God to be approved. It just means to be grown up. And the problem we have with most of Christianity is, is people get saved, but they never grow up. And how many know when you're born again, you become a babe in Christ? Amen. Amen. And in fact, the, the, the Bible calls you basically the Greek word for, for a newborn again child of God is a baby in Christ. But how many would be inappropriate in the natural for, for somebody to be newborn and stay a baby all of their life? You know, a Benjamin Button that stays the same the whole time. That you never grow up in Christ. But that's the way a lot of the church is. They're always wanting to just to return to the cross or wanting to just keep in mind their, their initial salvation. They just want to remember what Jesus died, you know, that Jesus died for their sins. And that's all wonderful. In fact, that's of utmost importance. You know, he died for your sin, right? Well, we were never meant to camp out there. We were meant to learn to go into the kingdom of heaven and live above the curse of the world. To live above the limitations of the world and go on to spiritual maturity. Amen. That you live differently than you lived before. And the average Christian, the average Christian in America, gets saved, they go to church, and they try to be a little bit nicer than they were before, never really grow up in the kingdom. Let me describe this just for a minute. Here's the example I gave my church, maybe I've given it here before. But if I describe this side of the pulpit here as the world system, have I talked about this in here before? If I take this side of the pulpit, I call this the world system. This is what we were birthed into. This is what we've grown up into. This is what we dwell in right now. In the world system, we have limitations of man's strength, man's ability. You follow me? We're subject to the curse of the world. The demons have much authority and, and power in this realm we live in. Amen. Witchcraft function is in, in this area. Now, we do some great things. We can set a man with a moon and bring him back safely, right? We can, we can invent smartphones. Praise God for smartphones. Amen. Just stay off of it right now while I'm preaching. And, uh, <laughs> what, a, what, a wonderful, what wonderful things we can do over here. But over here it's also the realm of sickness. It's the realm of lack. I hate lack. How about you? Yeah. It's, the, it's the realm of temper tantrums. Wanting to eat everything in the refrigerator. <laughs> the realm of emotional meltdowns, spending everything on a credit card. This is the realm of living in the curse. But praise God, Jesus put a cross that lets us come out of that realm. Amen? And I want to let the pulpit represent the cross of Christ. And anyone that, that will see and desire can recognize there's a cross potential made available to them. And come to the cross, confess their sins, receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and be redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen. 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 And you can be actually delivered from the limitations of the system. If you know how to. If you'll grow with to it. Now, on the other side of the cross is another kingdom. Oh, here's what we would call the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. You follow me? The third heaven realm, the realm of the spirit. And over here is the realm of low, no limitation. No sickness, no lack, no tears, no oppression, no suicide, no fear. Amen. Not limited by man's ability, only limited by your faith, which you can believe for God to do in your life. And God's intention has always been that we recognize the cross as a gateway versus a stopping point. As a portal to another kingdom we can dwell in as a believer versus what we're always trying to go back to as a religious Christian. See, so many Christians, if I can, if I can describe this pictorially, you wanted some pictures. I'm giving you a picture here right now without a chalkboard. 
most Christians living in this realm, they reach a place they just can't take it anymore. Oh, Lord, I'm at the end of my ropes. I can't take it anymore. I just want to die. Oh, God, please help me. And they, they have the cross revealed to them. Somebody tells them about Jesus willing to forgive their sins, deliver them from their past, amen, and let them dwell in this place of forgiveness. And they come to the cross, to this gateway, and they receive the greatest miracle they'll ever know. They get born again. Amen? Amen. Their sins are taken away. God gives them a brand new nature. They are born again with the heart of God on the inside. And the average Christian stops right there. In fact, what they usually do is they come to the cross. They receive this experience with unlimited potential connected to it. And they go right back to living in a limited system. And they're as sick as the world. They're as oppressed as the world. They're as lacking as the world. Amen. Their marriages are, are, are threatened as much as the world. And they live over here trying to be a little bit of a nicer person, but still limited by the world system. And an open target for demonic harassment. Amen. Especially when you become a Christian, the devil's going to target you. And now they're fighting battles and everything they have to fight. And they're thinking, it was easier for me when I was in the world. Well, yes, but you're still in the world. And God's plan for us was never to go to the cross and revert back to where we used to live or how we used to live. It was always to go to this gateway, receive the impartation of new life, and go forward into the kingdom of heaven. Learning how to become matured in this new realm. See, it's kind of, it's kind of, I want you to get this, this mental picture. Over here, you were born into this realm as a baby. Do you follow me? And I don't know what age you got saved at, but it probably wasn't at six months. It was probably, you know, sometime later. Do you follow me? At some point, you came to the realization that Jesus was the Son of God. You gave Him your life. and But you were growing up here from a little baby naturally to a grown-up person physically. But when you come to the cross... Jesus said a man must be born again, or born twice, right? Born a second time. And when you come to the cross, all of a sudden, even though you maintain the same grown-up physical body, now all of a sudden, spiritually, you're a little baby again. And I don't know about you, but I remember when my children were born, we didn't feed them adult food. We fed them baby food. We changed their diet. And when you come to the cross, there's a necessity. You change what you feed yourself on spiritually. Amen. You're no longer feeding yourself on the internet as your sole source of information. Or CNN. Or what the guys say at work. Do you follow me? People Magazine or, God forbid, the New York Times. Now all of a sudden, as a baby, your diet's changed and you feed yourself on the Word of God. And you intentionally Feed yourself all the Word of God that you can. And you expose yourself to the Word of God in every, in every form you can. I remember when I got saved, I was hungry for the Word. We spent hours and hours a day in the Word. And I would listen to nothing but, to, but Christian radio. Or back then, cassette tapes I could get a hold of. And pump Word, Word, Word. Why? Because I wanted to grow up. There was a desire in me to want to learn to walk spiritually. To want to run spiritually. To be able to grow up in the things of the kingdom of heaven. And the word is our source of nourishment to do that. And God has given us an assignment to go beyond baby things. The basic principles. To advance in the kingdom of heaven unto full perfection or spiritual maturity. Amen. And tonight I want to take a few minutes and talk to you. Or I might take more than a few about what it means to be spiritually mature and what the Word of God declares you need to do to step into it. Now, the first word we're talking about here is the word teleos. That's the way I'm going to pronounce it, whether it's like that or not. And uh, that means to be finished, to be mature, to be complete, to be, to be without lack in anything in your life. And God has assigned us as believers not to stay babies, but to grow up. Amen. 
Did, did, was there ever anything in your life that you wanted to be really, really good at? <coughs> Perhaps. I mean, my wife was a dancer when she was young. She wanted to get really good at dancing, and she became really good at it. <coughs> Pastor Bob wanted to get his, his, his education uh, maxed out as a doctor, and he's almost there. And, and <coughs> all the dissertation, right? Yeah. And there are things maybe in your life you targeted you wanted to become really good at. You know, mine might have been at hunting or archery. Or really, the one I wanted to be really good at was fishing. I love to fish. Maybe you wanted to be really good at basketball or baseball or football. Wait a minute, this is still at home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to be good at something, and so you applied yourself to it. Can anybody identify with this tonight? <laughs> Hopefully you had that much of a desire to excel at something. That, that no matter what it was, you targeted, you wanted to be really good. My grandmother, my grandmother on my dad's side, she passed away right before she turned 96. She was born uh, two weeks to the day before the Titanic sank. And, uh, and she lived with us for a long time. But from the time she was, I knew her till she was probably 90, well, almost, in, she was over 95, she crocheted. Fine crochet work. Not yarn, fine freight. And would do massive work. So she was shipping all over the world. People were asking for her stuff. And she would take however long and she'd crochet these works and sell it, and sell it to them for, to the, for the price of her thread. That's all she wanted. But she maxed out the ability to crochet these, these phenomenal works. So it doesn't have to be something everybody can see or appreciate. It's what you have a heart to be good at. You follow what I'm talking about? Once you're born again, your desire should shift at what you want to, what, of what you really want to excel at some level. You should want to you should want to excel being a Christian because that's all that you're going to take in eternity. Amen. You follow me? Yeah. I don't care how good at football or basketball or or knitting you are, you're not taking that to heaven. But you are going to take what you did for the sake of Christ into heaven. And we should target becoming perfected in our spiritual maturity as being a Christian. Amen. Amen. And then reprioritize the things of your life toward that goal. What we've learned, what we've learned is, here's one thing I used to collect. I collected comic books as a kid. And I had, uh, you name a comic book movie out there, whatever, I had, in some cases, the entire series of the comic book. Name of movies and comic books, I had the entire series of And I targeted filling out these series of comic books as a kid. And uh, I was so proud I'd have these, you know, I had probably one time maybe a couple thousand comics, I don't know. And I thought, someday I'll sell these, I'll make a bunch of money, I'm going to display them, whatever. And one day God said, I want you to throw all those away. I did. I threw boxes and boxes of mid condition comic books <coughs> into the dumpster. The early X Men comics into the dumpster. Poor stuff on top of them so they couldn't be taken out. I said destroy them because they were full of false gods. <coughs> I threw that collection I spent all of my life away at God's assignment. Now that may seem like a waste, but I'm convinced God. Blessed me way above what I could have got out of having a comic book collection with the anointing. Out of speedy, speedy obedience. Out of doing what he said to do. The same with whatever you sow. God, he, he's looking for people that are wanting to go on to perfection and obey him rapidly, right? And so that comic book collection, I spent all the time and produced nothing for me. But what I do for heaven produces overflowing blessing in my life. Now what I'm getting at is as you move from the cross and you start maturing in the kingdom of heaven, there are, there are blessings that come on your life that you can never attain or access in the other realm. Over here, if you learn to apply yourself by faith to it, you can walk in divine health and never have to be sick another day of your life. 
Over here you can access divine prosperity where you never have to be broke another day of your life. Over here you can access the supernatural love of God where you never have to have any fear or anxiety another day of your life. Over here you can access the glory of God where the devils can't even touch you. You're beyond their reach. Over here is a place where you can walk in total fulfillment, peace, and joy. I mentioned this uh, Friday night, and I may have mentioned it here before, but I've been in the glory before. God said several times, I've lost count how many times God said the glory come on me. One time for nearly two weeks where he said, I'm giving you a taste of what's to come. And in that glory, you virtually can't have a down day. Faith is automatic. Joy is overflowing. Just the love of God and the love of your fellow man. You can't hate anybody. Amen. Amen. Right now I have to watch how much of Fox News I watch because they try to post both sides of the argument. And I want to reach through the screen and grab somebody <laughs> of the opposing argument. Or even the clips they show. Makes me mad. But in the glory, you would laugh at it. <laughs> and God will deliver us. Praise you, John. Bless you, Lord God. Because over here in this kingdom, as you mature it, as you advance it, you never have any more problems the further you advance. How many want that? How many have been raised up with the mentality we're just trudging our way through this life? Life is just a bowl of cherries, but you have to watch out for the pits. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, a lot of people, even Christians, have this mentality of being better if I'd never been born. There's just too many trials, too many challenges. The reason in Christianity we still have trials and challenges is we're still living in this realm over here. We came to the cross where we received that divine impartation of new life, and then we're right back not knowing how to use faith, not learning how to, to move into spiritual perfection or maturity. And we're still living by the world. Amen. Or the world's limited results. And I don't want that. I don't like days of frustration. I don't like days of limit. I don't like days you're fighting symptoms. I don't like days of strife. I hate strife. In fact, uh, I don't mean this negatively at all, but my wife is a Fox News junkie. She takes about 12 programs a day on it, watches it all the time, just like Fox News. And I can walk in, and when they've got a few people on there that are arguing, I can leave the room. And I'll tell her, either you change it or I'm leaving, because I can, I'm not sitting in it, in it under the influence of arguing. Because it grinds at my spirit nature, Amen. my divine nature. And I don't mean that negative towards her. She's, she's educating herself for what's going on. But there's a part of it that, that I can't sit under. Here's what's funny. I used to be able to sit under. I used to be a Fox News junkie or news junkie. But anymore, there's been a development in me that I can't expose myself to it anymore. And it wants to pull me back into old mentalities, old reactions, old feelings that we are supposed to be delivered from. Now, not that I'm perfect or I don't have bad days. My wife would attest to you that I've had some moments. <laughs> Amen. 2018 had a few moments in it. Not that I've sinned majorly or quit or anything like that. You know, I never hit her. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean anything to her. I'm talking about frustrating moments. <clears throat> and, and, and it had challenges. And you had to fight one to revert back to the flesh. But you come to the place you know that you're supposed to live over here and you don't want to expose yourself to that anymore. Amen. Amen. And in the New Testament, perfection with God is developing or maturing, learning how to live in this realm over here. Amen. But you've got to target it. First you've got to realize it's available and then you've got to target it. We have in my church these confession cards. And I believe confessions are important to be able to live in that new realm. Because you have what you say. Right? You know, we go to Pastor Bob's church and for several years, every time we go there, at the beginning of their Sunday morning service, they, they start quoting 
Grace Fellowship is a church full of capacity, and they start confessing all these great things about the church. I'm sure they could quote it verbatim, right, with your eyes closed. And uh, Debbie probably have to help off some of the pastor. Bob. <laughs> they could quote that saying they're confessing the future over their church. But well, if we want to operate in this realm over here, this realm was activated by words. And we have in our church a whole display set of confession cards about your healing, about your prosperity, about your marriage, about uh, whether you're in strife or not, whether you have peace. We have these cards about righteousness. And in fact, I think we have, oh, maybe 20 different topics right now set up. Love, that you can take a card and start reading the scriptures off and declare over your life. Here's an aspect of the kingdom of heaven I live and dwell in. Do you follow me? And these are free to anybody that wants them. They're in the back set up on a table right in the center of the sanctuary pretty much. And anybody that wants them can get them and speak them over their lives. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? How many want to get some cards here? Well, let me tell you what happens. People have the cards available, but many times they'll come up in a prayer line and I'll say, what scriptures are you confessing? Well, I don't, I don't have any scriptures on this. I said, there's cards right back there. Well, I, I just haven't, I haven't got any. Or I have it, but I haven't read them. Well, see, here's the problem. You know there's an opportunity to dwell in this realm. You know the provisions already made available to, to excel in this realm. But you're not applying yourself to the principles. Remember the basic principles you're going to leave behind? You're not applying yourself to the basic principles of the realm. And because you're not applying yourself, you're not going to get the results of that realm. This realm doesn't function like this realm. We were talking some about the military this morning. And in the military, if I get it right with, with, with regard to a lot of promotions, they take into account something called time and grade. Is that how you would say it? Yeah. You're at a certain level so long, and now you're qualified for, for a promotion. And I, had a, I, had a, I have a niece that was in Iraq for several times, and, and she moved into to captain status in record time. And they had to hold her at a lower level for a while because... She had had enough time and grade. But over here, a lot of your promotion is based on how long you've been in that position. Right? How long you've been at that rank. This realm, you care less how long you've been at that rank. You can, you can have been to say 50 years. You can go to church every time the doors are open. You can even be able to quote many verses of Scripture. Preach some sermons. But over here, promotion is based solely on application combined with spiritual maturity and development. See, I like this. When I worked for IBM years ago, everybody wanted to be in management. That was the place of upper opportunity, you know, to climb in the company. And a lot of times somebody would be in a position for so long, they say, okay, you've been here now 20 years, we're going to make you a manager. You know, more than anybody around, so we're going to make you a manager. But if they had people come in that were really sharp, they were really, how can I say, goal-focused or willing to apply themselves, they would put them on a fast track. And instead of taking 20 years to be a manager, they may take a year. They may promote them three or four levels in a matter of a few years. Why? Because they're wanting to accelerate their growth to get them ready to fill high-level positions because there were so many levels that go up in Ivy, you had to really be promoted through those rapidly to be ready to fill the highest levels. And they would promote you through these levels uh, to get you prepared. God the same way. God, God may promote a few people in here because they've been in long enough, they know enough to be promoted. Usually it's the ones that have a hunger to target spiritual growth and perfection. He's going to lift up to the highest levels. I've discovered that if somebody comes into the church and they'll spend a couple years praying and fasting in the Lord, seeking God, God will elevate them above people who have been in the church for 40 years. 
to give them more anointing, more responsibility, more opportunity. You follow me? And even show them greater results because they chose to apply themselves to the kingdom. Like I said, I've got all these confession cards available, but if I was asked my church for a show of hands, how many are confessing some of these cards over their life every day, I bet it would be less than 50%. Not attacking my church at all. What I'm saying is, is we're so used to dwelling over here, living by time and grade, just doing the basics, going through the motions, doing what everybody does. We don't realize we're supposed to be promoted over here, going into perfection by applying ourselves at high levels. Are you following me on this tonight? And God's wanting to raise up people with a desire not to be limited. Tell you what, my wife, she is not a pushy person. She is <coughs> a, 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 a boisterous person. She's not someone trying to run over people. But you better not push her. You try to tell her what she has to do, she'll dig in her heels and say, I'm not doing that. Do you follow me? And uh, uh, because she knows. She's not going to be shoved around. And so, she may not be one that's going to try to run over people over in this room over here, but she's going to follow a plot myself, God will promote me over here. I'm going to try to make this point clearly if I can. Over here is not a competition. Over here is a self-application arena. Again, when I worked in the corporate world, it was all it was a competition. People were undercutting each other, people were trying to, to, to outdo each other, they were studying each other, trying to position themselves for better jobs, and and promotion became an opportunity, or let's just say a competition between a lot of other people. But in the kingdom of heaven, you're not competing. With anybody but yourself. With the devil in the flesh. You understand me? How much of it do you want? In fact, God says over here, the more you promote those around you, the more you promote those around you, the more I'll promote you. Way back, this would have been in the early 80s. Uh, I had an interview with my second level manager. They called him a skip level interview. Get him every year or two. And he, he was really willing to hire him into the company. He was an older gentleman. He was a World War II vet. And he liked me because I'd done farm work. Amen. He said, if you can haul hay like you've hauled hay, you can work here. So I didn't know that was a qualification. And the area I was full of I don't know if we're going to run or not, but the story that we're going to go into. Uh, in, the, in the late 70s, IBM and Lexington was targeting huge growth in the typewriter industry. And they, in my area, in my department, they just went out and hired 120 of the top engineers in the nation. I mean, top level. Guys that were hard charging, extremely focused, and somehow I slipped in. And uh, because I had all that. And they let me in. And so I'm working with all these guys competing and, you know, working overtime and, you know, going to extra classes and stuff. I'm going to the bars every night. That was me. I paid. The old man was coming out. And I uh, had this interview. And he said, what do you want to do in the company? And I said, well, what I would really like to do is I would like to, I would like to go into those management spots. Now, we had nine first-level managers in the whole area of 120 engineers. And I said, I'd like to fill one of those positions, but I don't see much chance of that because there's only nine, and all these other guys have come in that are just stellar, you know, grades and background and such like that. And uh, uh, I don't think that's even possible. And he, he, he looked forward in his chair, and I remember so clearly, he said to me, Jack, if you almost cry yourself, IBM's a big company. And it 
position to be made for you if you will excel in what you do. I said, okay. Not that I wasn't already working, you know, uh, I thought at a high level. I started just not concerning about what other people didn't care what anybody else did. Wasn't competing. I just did my job the best I could do, and I supported everybody around. And it wasn't long after that they called me and said we were making one of those managers. And I didn't know it, but it turned out of the 120 engineers, I was the top producer in the entire area, getting more work done than any of them. And so they made me a manager, not by competition, but by just learning to excel in my own application of my assignment. Back last March, I had a dream. And in the dream, Jesus came to me in the dream. And he showed me the churches of the world, churches, his churches worldwide. And he showed me in the churches in America, they are filled with competitive attitudes. If I could just have the best programs, the harvest will come into my church. Yeah, I can bring the people in. If I could just give them those user-friendly uh, uh, surroundings, they'll come to my church. If I can just have short enough services, they'll come to my church. If I don't stretch them with the word, they'll come to my church. And he showed me all these different types of, 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 of ministers around the world. And he said, he said, Jack, none of those churches are going into my glory. Amen. I mean, that sounds bizarre. But when I read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and, he wrote, and Jesus has seven letters written to seven, to seven churches, to only two of the churches passed. One was neutral, and four were in trouble. God grades his church's application efforts. What they tolerate and what they don't tolerate. It's clear from the word. I mean, Paul didn't mess around with what he spoke for and what he spoke against. So he said, none of those churches, and this was, a, this was just a, one of those dreams that, that was so clear. He said, none of these churches are going into the glory. And he said, the ones that are going into my glory are the ones that will teach the word and pursue the spirit, just to paraphrase what he said. They will just apply themselves to their assignment and not be concerned about how many people come not be concerned of whether the people want to like them or not, but they're willing to stretch the people into their assignments and target the glory. He said, they're the ones going into it. And I'm telling you, America's clear full of user-friendly church surroundings. I mean, you can, you can put up a cross and a sign and say, brand new church and people will flood into it. And you come in, and when you come in, you tell them, just know that God loves you. Just know that the blood has covered your sins. Just know that everything's going to be okay. God sees your situation. Now go and be blessed. And the people go home the same as they came in. Just with an encouraging word to hold on. And that's not going to cut it. In the eyes of God, I'm sometimes. The reason churches like this one, churches like Pastor Bob's and mine and so many others, are overflowing with people, it's because people don't like to be stretched. They go to school, they're stretched. They go to work, they're stretched. They go to church, they don't want to be stretched. They want to be petted. Is this okay with you tonight? Is this okay, Pastor Mike? But in the church of the kingdom of heaven, there's a, you, you're birthed into as a baby. There's a raising of a, and a maturing that has to take place. And you can't just take a baby and shove it in a corner. Here's some, you know, mashed peas and applesauce. Do the best you can and they're going to come out of it okay. There's a nurturing process. And there's a, there's a teaching and a raising up and even a correction process. It takes place in raising a baby up into adulthood. And the same thing is true in the kingdom of God. God says he that's without chastening is a illegitimate child, if I can put it in those terms. God's looking for people that will say, I'm targeting spiritual maturity. I'm targeting fullness of growth. I'm targeting growing up into Him. I'm targeting the glory. And they'll say, I'm willing to fight every devil in hell to go there. Amen. We used to have a pastor in Lexington, black pastor. 
And I love to listen to him on the radio. He was a Baptist, and the sermons weren't that great, but he had a fire in him. And he had this saying, he's going on to be with Jesus now, and he would say this, Have I got any warriors? <laughs> and I'd be, on, I'd be in the car ready, Yes! <laughs> yes! I want to be a warrior for God. <clears throat> now here's what's neat. Understand, I'm so far off the notes tonight, we're not even, we're not even in that vicinity. <laughs> but we'll just assume this is the Holy Spirit going the direction we need to go tonight. Is that okay? Yeah. When I was growing up, I was of normal height and size until I reached about fifth grade and I quit growing. And by the time I'm in seventh grade, I'm going to a very large high school, or junior high in Huntsville, Alabama. And one morning, the PE coach calls me over to the side. And he has me go to the wall. He said, I want you to stand on your toes and reach as high as you can on the wall. And I go, what is all this about? So I did, and he took a pencil and he marked right there. I said, why did you want me to do that? And he said, well, we're getting these new things called, in called pegboards. I want the shortest boy in school to see how high he could reach to make sure he could reach him. <laughs> <laughs> I was the shortest boy in junior high. And off of junior high, uh, I know it's hard to imagine I was small, but uh, small. All the way through junior high, I'm the smallest boy in, the, in, in, in school, except for finally a new boy came to school. He, was a, he became my best friend. He was a half inch shorter than me. <laughs> <laughs> and we finally, you know, back then it was junior high, so uh, you stayed in junior high through ninth grade. And so in 10th grade, we're still short. And we go together to high school our first day as a sophomore in high school. And we're walking through the halls looking for our classes because we took some classes together. And all of a sudden, here came the assistant principal. And he walked in and said, what are you guys doing here? I said, well, we're trying to find our classes, you know, something like that. He says, what? Follow me. And he marched us. First day of school to the principal's office, marched to the principal's office, head principal, school. We're talking about a huge high school. And we're standing there thinking, what did we do? And he said to the, to the head principal, look what they're sending us now. <laughs> I question whether I was a, a little people or not. I can't say midget anymore. I was a, well, I was a little person, person or not. And, uh, it wasn't until I hit my senior year of high school that I shot up. And I probably went from 5'4 to 5'9 or 10 my senior year. Just shot up that year. And uh, since, since that time, I've been shooting out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be, be a well-rounded person. <laughs> I don't have a six-pack. I have a kid. <laughs>
Did it always did it ever seem unfair to you that maybe you were in high school and you could never be hit cheerleader because you weren't as pretty as the one that was on the cheerleading team, or or maybe maybe some of you were hit cheerleader. Uh, maybe you couldn't you be the captain of the football team because you weren't as athletic as Pastor Bob. And, and uh, wait a minute. <laughs>
And that's why I was. And then in September 1991, God said, I want you to start a Bible study in your house. And he laid, it was just clear. I was, in fact, I was getting in my van. Patty was driving. I was getting in the van. As I'm getting in the van, God did a download on me. Start a Bible study in your house, and all these things were laid out. And I said, God, you know I don't speak publicly. And he didn't respond. He didn't even, he didn't answer back. He just said, do it. So I spewed at him. We talked about that this morning and morning. That next Monday, I held my first Bible study. I called people up. First, I talked to Pastor Callan, who was my pastor at the time. I talked to him about it. God said, do this. He said, go ahead and do it. I made me a little pulpit out of a camera stand on a piece of plywood. Called some people up. We had a pretty good crowd that first night. I had a, I had a big basement, you know, parking and finish, and they filled up the basement. And I'm going, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm going to preach for about an hour to an hour and a half was the plan to speak. I spent 20 hours preparing the first message. 20 hours. I'm talking about an intense study. And I stepped behind the pulpit with all my notes pretty much written out, what I was going to read. And when I stepped behind the pulpit, the anointing of God came on my life to speak in front of people. Very good. The fear left and a peace came on me and the ability to teach the word out of the Bible came on me. And now that's 28 years. This 28th year, 27 and a half, it's never lifted. I still don't like to speak publicly. You have me in a group of people sitting down, they say, say your name, I'll stutter over it sometimes. I mean, that's the tendency. Until I get up and teach the word and the anointing comes on me. What I'm getting at is, is it's not based on how well you speak, whether you can preach or not. When we're weak, he is strong. God doesn't promote you based on what you do well. He promotes you based on what you trust him to do through you. So once you get born again and you're this baby, it's now, it's now an equal race. Although we're not competing, it's a race. Paul talked about, right? And now you go forward in the kingdom of God on an equal footing with every other Christian. And it's just based on how much you desire to learn and how willing you are to obey what God reveals to you. Amen. Amen. And I've heard stories. I remember when I was first saved, I've been saved a couple of years, and I heard this man named Joe Jatui preach. He was from Africa. And he was, he was from a... a tribe in Africa, a group living in huts, dirt floors, and some missionaries came through, traveled through, and he'd never heard it before. He was actually the grandson of a witch doctor, and they taught him about salvation out of the Bible. And of his entire tribe, or whatever it is, his village, that's what I'm a village, he was the only one that came up and gave his life to God. God spoke to him and said, you know, this is true. And he went up and received Jesus. And they spent a couple days with him, teaching him the word. And then they said to him, they said, we have to move on to the next village. And of course, there was no church to go to around. They said, we're going to leave you with this Bible. Read it. Believe it. And do it. And God will see you through. And so he did. Now, he spoke several languages. But he hadn't been saved, I don't think, more than a few weeks and he's in this Bible, he's devouring the Word. And all of a sudden, as he's seeking God and crying out to God, a wind came through his hut, if I remember the story right, and the power of God hit him, and only filled the hut, and he started praying and praising God, and he couldn't do it well enough in Swahili. Then he switched to English and then French, he could speak some different languages. It's amazing how many people in the world speak languages, you know, multiple languages. You know what you call a person who speaks three languages? You heard this before? What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. Bilingual. What do you call a person who speaks one language? American. American. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the world sees it. And they tell that joke around the world too. The Spirit of God fills the, 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 the little hut he's in. And he can't express his love for God in the languages he knows. And all of a sudden, out comes this new language. 
God baptized him in the Holy Spirit, not even knowing what it was. In, his, in fact, he was reading in, in, in Acts chapter 2 when it happened. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost right there. And then it wasn't a short time later. We don't always say for weeks. A short time later, somebody in the village dies. And he's been dead for, for several days. And he comes back and hears about it and he raises him from the dead. Now here's the key. He, was the, he says he was the grandson of a witch doctor. He saw demonic activity all the time. He saw supernatural events. He knew demons were real. And he realized if demons were real, then this God must be real. He got power over it, and he just believed it. Acted on it, and God backed it up. Now, I don't believe you get much more handcuffed spiritually than to be in a dirt hut in the middle of Africa with no teachers, no church, no TV, no internet, just the Bible. That's about as handcuffed as you can get. You follow me? As far as, 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 far as learning. Yet God, because of his heart and willingness to obey, launched him into ministry. The next thing you know, he's in, he's in America going to Lee College, learning from teachers of the Word. How much do you want God to move in your life? How much do you want spiritual maturity? How much will you target God advancing you in the kingdom? How long have I been going? Two hours yet? Let me, let me go to a, a, a passage. I just want to finish out with some teaching on this. Pull a couple of things. I didn't get to the second Greek word yet even, did I? Go to Matthew chapter 5. I'm showing I've been going 23 minutes. <coughs> I can really judge how long it's been by the Snickers. <laughs> I can tune in. I've been going like 40 minutes. That's closer. There was a chuckle, but no Snickers. You learn these things. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. Yeah. You've heard that story too, right? The halfway story? Has anybody heard the halfway story? Yeah. This would have been back 1992, 93. We'd opened a church in Madison, Indiana. And I'd been invited to go preach at it. And uh, yeah, I think it would have been 92. And we go to go to this church, and there's only maybe five people in the, in the service. It's a huge setting. They had rented a, a building next to a Kroger. I mean, it was a huge room. And a lot of chairs set up, but about five people in the service. And we just got started, and this drunk lady came in. And she was inebriated. Amen. And probably had some company, too. She staggers in and sits down in the chair. I get up to preach, and I preach about an hour and 15 minutes. I'm about to close. Not now, but then I was. And, <laughs> and as a joke, I said, well, we're about halfway. She jumped up and goes... Halfway! Halfway! He's been speaking over an hour and he says he's only halfway! <laughs> well, I had to go another hour and a half just to it. So every once in a while in my service, I'll go, we're about halfway and I'm checking for drugs. <laughs> My wife is over here saying, half till I'm halfway. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, are you there? And verse number 48. Be ye therefore perfect, teleos, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. How many know God's perfect? Do you believe you'll ever be as perfect as God? Well, spiritually you already are. And the Bible says when we see Him, we'll be as He is. You're not going to be God. You'll never be God. But you'll be without sin as perfectly as God. Do you follow me? But it's talking to believers now. I don't believe we will ever reach total.
total perfection like God on this side of eternity. You follow me? But how can we apply that to our lives today? Well, knowing that the word perfection means to be mature and equipped, then we should be targeting being mature and equipped like God. Can you see Jesus having a bad day? I mean, if he's God, and they were trying to persecute him, he had chances for bad days. He said, I've had enough. Somebody, go get me a fifth. Go get me a fifth there, James. I, I need you to sit down and get me a good drunk on. <laughs> past Matt past Matt rolled up on a blur. That's some good stuff there, Peter. <laughs> Emotional breakdown. I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus is having an emotional breakdown. I've had enough of you disciples. You never did nothing wrong. I want to quit. <laughs> yeah, we may be prone to say those things and have those things. You follow me? Go buy, you know, a five pound box of chocolates and eat all of them in one day. Because we wouldn't drink, we wouldn't drink or do drugs, but we might eat a whole box of chocolates in a day. Well, I got some, I got some results on that one. I'm going to spend all the money on a credit card, or go chew somebody out, or cry all day, have a pity party, call up people and complain about somebody else. Those are all signs of not being like God, not being mature. And as well, God being fully equipped means you have with on your life to be perfect means you have all the anointing on you that God wanted to, wants to equip you with. You're functioning in all the gifts that God wants you to, to operate in. You're, you're operating in all the authority of the Spirit God would have you operate in. That's maturity with God. That's perfection with God. But instead, we've replaced it in the church with, with church attendance and trying to be nice. That's not like God. There's a lot of churches God won't even attend. Amen? Amen? And we have substituted spiritual goals and spiritual exercises with worldly, powerless tradition that produces nothing but more frustration, more condemnation. And we're to be as perfect, as equipped, and spiritual and mature as God Himself. Now, the word there, teleos, means to be equipped and mature. There's a second word we don't have time to go into very far today, tonight. We're halfway. <coughs> I found that if, if you say that and they, they fuss, they're drunk, if they chuckle, they're, they're drugged. <laughs> the second word, go to Luke chapter 6. We'll finish with this. I feel like I've not been looking at phone enough. I have about 70 scriptures here. We've made it to three. Three? <laughs> <laughs> you want them all, right? You're not leaving until I teach them all the good saying. I understand. If you can do a thousand acts of kindness, truly we can do 70 scriptures in the night. Right? <laughs> Luke chapter 6. Let me get there. Here's what sounds like a very similar passage, but it's a little bit different. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect, there's perfect again, right? Shall be as his master. Now, that word perfect is a different word than teleos. It's the word katarkizo. A totally different Greek word, but it means very similar. And katarkizo means to be, how can I say it? To be equipped, mended, repaired, raised up, 
fitly joined. And really what it's telling us is that teleos is the goal, but katartizo is the process to get to the goal. Amen. And with katartizo is what I've been talking about tonight. The willingness to let God change you. The willingness to let God raise you up. The goal is teleos, to be like God. But there's a process of katartizo where you say, God, change me. Do spiritual or really soul surgery on me. Change how I think. think how, change how I react. Change my heart. Change my priorities. Cause me to act in alignment with your word. Cause me to be hungry for prayer and intercession. God, change me. That's catechism. In fact, correction. Spiritual correction, even by God or your pastor, comes under the heading of catechism. So many people don't want the pastor to correct them. You can pet me, but don't try to change me. It's not like cats. Amen? You can train a dog. The cats are a little more challenging. And somebody that is saying, okay, God, I'm going after capertizo, I'm going after perfection, is so saying, I'm volunteering for the process to transform me into the image of Christ. Well, whatever God wants you to do, whatever He wants you to change, whatever He wants you to sow, wherever, wherever he, want, he wants you to go, you will do it because you want to accelerate your, your, your <laughs> spude operations, speedy obedience into being <coughs> teleos, perfected, mature with God. Now here's Here's what I'm trying to get at tonight. I've got a lot more verses we could go to to back up some of this. But the summation is, those that really learned or function in this realm of the kingdom of heaven, they go beyond the cross. They don't get stuck at the cross. They don't go back to the world. Are the ones that say, God, I want you to do it your way. I want you to learn how, I'm willing to learn how to operate in this new kingdom by spiritual principles versus by natural competition. And I don't care how much it stretches me, what it requires of me, what shifts in my life that are necessary. I will volunteer for you to transform my life. I remember this would have been back again, probably 1984, 85, <clears throat> that I was praying. I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit, been saved, but I was sitting in my recliner reading the Word, and I said, God. I just want all that you have. I heard some about faith and about healing and prosperity and all these things. And I said, God, I just want to fulfill your high call in my life. And I said, I don't care what it takes. I don't care what you have to do. I don't care what you have to change in my life. I don't care what I have to give up. And back then, I was fasting all the time. You can tell I've not fasted quite as much lately. But whatever it is, God, lead me into it and I will do it. And the first verse, the voice I heard back was the devil. He said, you'll lose your wife, your children, your house, and you will die alone and in great pain. Broke. Because you were willing to do this. And I knew that was not God. And I said, God, I know you were well able to protect my health, my marriage, my children, and my finances, and my house. Trust you with it. I give it to you right now. Amen. And all of a sudden, God launched me on an even more accelerated program of seeking after Him. And if I remember right, it was soon after that He connected me to Apostle Callahan, my spiritual father, even today. God never takes you beyond where you want to go. But I'm hoping tonight I've birthed in you a desire to go. A willingness to say, hey, I'm an equal footing. Say, I don't want to race. I don't want to run a race I can't do well in. I don't play games I don't, I can't win. That's why I play with Pastor Bob a lot. Games. It just came out, amen. So the God's family is so close to Rob. Rob's bleeding over on. It's like electric. 
voltage jumping. <laughs> that I'm hindered, that I'm too short, I'm too ugly, I'm too dumb, I'm whatever. But I know in the kingdom of heaven, everybody's on equal footing Amen. to fulfill their calling and excel. Amen. It's only limited by how much you want to apply yourself to it. Anybody want that? Amen. Pastor Mike, thank you for the opportunity to move tonight. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Praise the Lord.